Hey everyone, we're going to talk about stretch, strain, and rotation today in the course of our discussion of kinematics. So these are all going to come from the deformation gradient and they describe locally how we're smushing and stretching and rotating the material. So we're going to start with the polar decomposition of the deformation gradient. So the deformation gradient is F, that is equal to the rotation times the right stretch tensor, which is equal to the left stretch tensor times the same rotation. So here u is the square root of f transpose f. And v is the square root of f f transpose. So I guess I already said it, but R is called the rotation, and U and V are called the right and left stretch tensors, respectively. Or the right and left, rather. They're useful for proofs, um, so if we wanted to figure out, and we'll use them in some proofs today, talking about the lengths of deformed little infinitesimal displacements from points and things like that. But um, the fact that there's this tensor square root in here makes them pretty impractical to use in any real application because they're difficult to calculate. Um, it's very easy to calculate F transpose F if you have F, but calculating the square root of a tensor, well, if we want to calculate the tensor square root, we would get its components in matrix form, right? So relative to a basis. But then if you want to calculate the square root of a matrix, you're pretty much stuck diagonalizing it, which is a nasty hard problem in general, um, even though it's a symmetric matrix, you know, if it were a general matrix, it could be a real problem to calculate it, but even diagonalizing a, a symmetric one is not necessarily all that easy. <clears throat> All right, so because of that, we're going to tend to work more with the squares of U and V, which are the right and left uh, Cauchy green deformation tensors. Sometimes they just call them the right and left Cauchy green tensors. That's not a pencil.
So we have C, the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor is equal to U squared. <coughs> is equal to F transpose F. And in components expressed relative to an orthonormal fixed basis, you know, so in a Cartesian frame, in other words, then C I J is equal to F K I F K J is equal to partial chi k with respect to reference configuration coordinate x i and then times partial chi k again the you know kth coordinate of the deformation now with respect to the j -th coordinate direction in the reference configuration. <coughs> and then we have the left Cauchy Green deformation tensor, or left Cauchy Green tensor B is equal to V squared is equal to F F transpose. And that is equal to Oopsies. So in components, the ij component of B, again, only ever with the fixed orthonormal basis for the background in this Cartesian frame. Well, that is F i k F j k. So we have partial chi i, partial x k, times partial chi j, partial x k. Again, where those derivatives here are both taken <coughs> with respect to the reference configuration coordinate. That Y is not going to work out that well when we go to uh, make it a PDF. Let's, yeah, good enough. <coughs> we can also come up with a pretty useful tensor representation of the strain that works in nonlinear elasticity. This is called the green St. Venant strain tensor, and it's not the only strain tensor that we use in nonlinear elasticity, but it is probably the most common tensor measure of strain used. Oh, that's a good way to get some, some English majors riled up, is if you want to go and figure out, should this be like a hyphen or should it be an EM dash? Should there be a space between St. Bernard? How's the, the dash work out there? Luckily, we have more important things to do. So we got E, capital E, it's going to mean the green St. Venant strain tensor. Uh, that is equal to one half 
f transpose f minus the identity, which is equal to 1 half c minus the identity. So some of you might have had linear elasticity before. Um, in the case where f is pretty close to the identity and the rotation is therefore small, you know, this here is going to end up being quite close to the symmetric part of f. Um, you'll find that the difference between the two <coughs> is quadratic in f. And so if you're assuming, well, is quadratic in f minus i. Um, so if you're assuming that f, the deformation gradient, is pretty close to the identity, so there's pretty close to nothing going on, then you know the, the square of f minus i should be quite small. Um, and so that's where the, the linear theory of elasticity and the small strain fits in with the, the green St. Venant strain tensors. When f gets close to the identity, the two are going to coincide. But we're going to use the fully nonlinear formulation in this class and make all of the approximations when we go to make them later on. But we want to derive the equations of motion for the general case. All right, so an interesting thing to note here, and this is really what makes the green St. Venant strain tensor so useful, is that f, if f is a rotation, then E is 0. Whereas if you have a pure rotation, the, um, <coughs> the symmetric part of f is not necessarily 0. Um, in particular, if you think of it in a matrix form, there can be diagonal things going on there. All right, so, so what do we have? We have E is equal to tensor 0 when F is a rotation. All right, so we can do the polar decomposition on F if it's a rotation. F is equal to R times U, but U is just the identity if it's a rotation. So E is equal to 1 half identity transpose R transpose, so those two are F transpose, and then R times the identity, the second two there are F, minus the identity. Well, the transpose of the identity is just the identity. R transpose times R is the identity because it is a rotation and the cube of the identity is just the identity. So E is equal to 1 half times the identity minus the identity is equal to tensor 0 when F is a rotation. We'll call that orth plus. Maybe move that up. You know, computers aren't always all that useful, huh? I think they put that up there. <laughs> Later on in the textbook, they'll denote the proper orthogonal group that way. So we'll do it here. All right, so, so because it doesn't register rotations as strains, no matter how big the rotations, uh, you know, that makes this a very useful 
measure of strain for nonlinear elasticity theory. So U, V, C, and B, which is the right and left stretch tensors and the right and left Cauchy Green tensors or Cauchy Green deformation tensors are symmetric. And they're also positive definite. So all of their eigenvalues are strictly positive. As a consequence of the fact that the determinant of F has to be greater than zero. You know, we're not turning space inside out or anything. The green St. Venant strain tensor is symmetric, but clearly it's not positive definite since it can be zero. The right stretch, right Cauchy green deformation tensor and green St. Venant strain all map material vectors to material vectors. So F maps material vectors to spatial vectors, and F transpose maps spatial vectors to material ones. And then the left stretch and left Cauchy green tensor map spatial vectors to spatial vectors. So then R, the rotation, is the part of F that maps material vectors to spatial vectors. All right, so let's consider three nearby points in the reference configuration. Um, if you follow, this is all chapter seven in the textbook. Um, they talk about infinitesimal fibers and finite fibers and all this other stuff. And it's true, it's valid. And like, it's, it's the way that they go about proving things in some other works, but we don't really in this textbook use the the whole fibers thing all that much. And I don't really think it's exposed in a way that makes it particularly illuminating, especially since the textbook really doesn't use it in any way in um, in what we're going to do that couldn't also be done in another way. So I think rather than trying to wrap your head around this fibers thing, let's just consider infinitesimal volume elements or like, you know, the displacements between points that are close by, right? And so whenever we go to set up differential equations, then we'll assume that it's not just close by, it's infinitesimal and, um, you know, all of your like order 
of the difference between the two points terms will go away. Um, so I'll, I'm going to expose this stuff from that perspective and try to, to stick with it from there. There's a number of different ways of looking at this. Um, like it would also work in what I'm about to show you if we considered FR and GR, which I'll show you in a little bit. If you considered those two different vector fields that were transforming as tangent vectors, all of this would work. Um, and like later on, if you stick with this, it'll probably make more sense to you that way. But I think the first time around, it probably makes the most sense in the way that I'm going to present it. But maybe it only makes the most sense or made the most sense to me that way, you know. Point being, there's a lot of different ways of looking at these things that are all compatible with one another. But outside the context of using it in a certain way, one way or the other might make a whole lot more sense to you. All right, so with that, let's kind of jump right into it. All right, so we're zoomed in really far in the reference configuration to like a, a pretty close neighborhood of the point x1. So we have x1. A material point. x2, another one. <coughs> and x3, a third one. All right, so we could draw like maybe the vector from x1 to x2, we'll call fr, and the vector from x1 to x3, we'll call gr. Right, so um, Given this way of looking at it, I think we can all agree, like if these are points and F and G remain the displacement from one to the other, at least as to the extent that these points are close together, then um, we can think of these as tangent vectors. All right, so we'll write out fr is equal to x2 minus x1 gr is equal to x3 minus x1 All right, and let's say at time t, so, you know, all this here is we're looking in the reference configuration. And now over here, we have at time t, we have x1. x2 and x3 with uh, this being what we'll call f because it's going to be the spatial new thing for fr. And this is going to be g. All right, so we can write out some things here. 
Oh, not that color. That's a new color. We don't want that. I simply won't do. All right, so X1, X2, and X3 are just what the material points X1, X2, and X3 deform to. We'll write that out. X1 is equal to chi of T acting on the material point X1. Same thing for 2 and 3. All right, well, if everything's nice and differentiable, and we sort of assumed that it is based on establishing all of this, then we know that x2 is equal to chi at t of x1 plus the deformation gradient evaluated at x1 acting on fr, which is, of course, x2 minus x1. You can go back here, right? So fr is x2 minus x1. That's why we can have the gradient acting on it like that. And then plus o magnitude of fr. So things that go to zero faster than fr does. So fr being our, we'll call it infinitesimal, but just really small, not quite infinitesimal, displacement from x1 to f2, x2 rather. Um, and similarly, x3 is equal to chi at time t x1 plus f evaluated at x1, now acting on g r, plus things that go to 0 faster than g r. All right, well, from that, we have that f is equal to x2 minus x1. So that's just equal to the deformation gradient evaluated at x1 acting on fr plus terms that go to 0 faster than fr <coughs> and g, which is blue. is equal to x3 minus x1. And now it's f acting on gr plus things that go to 0 faster than gr. All right, so um, we're going to take this whole evaluated at x1 thing to be understood. So we're just going to say that um, f is equal to f, fr plus o, fr. Oh, we're hearing a beagle now because Nicole. Hold on. <clears throat> I don't know if any have beagles. They are not very quiet dogs. She's outside now, so we're good. <clears throat> They're cute, though, tell you what.
All right, and then similarly, we're going to say that g is equal to the same thing, but with g of r plus o like that. All right, so we're going to say let the scalar epsilon be such that O epsilon is equal to max O G R O F R. It's like we're only talking about the case where both F R and G R are getting pretty small. Um, because this is only going to work when we're talking about small displacements. So, you know, really they're, they're all going to be of about the same order. And we're just saying that epsilon, the, the real number, is going to define the, the magnitude of that order. All right, so in that case, um, f dot g is equal to f f r dot f g r plus o well if you think about the inner product there and the fact that f r is in it and g r is in it um then you were to apply you know your your foil to the inner product of these two um well f r things that go faster than gr, that's going to go faster than fr dot gr. So the whole thing now is O epsilon squared. All right, so we can apply our polar decomposition to f in both cases. R u fr dot r u g r and then we can use the definition of the transpose All right, and then again, our transpose R is just equal to the identity <coughs> because it's a rotation. So then we have that um, U F R dot U G R is pretty darn close to f dot g, and it gets closer as f r and g r get smaller, the displacements from x1 to x2 and x3. All right, so that's pretty cool, but we can also use the definition of the transpose one more time. And u is symmetric, so u transpose u is u squared, which is equal to c, the right Cauchy-Green deformation tensor.
All right, so now that's for f dot g. Well, what if we think of f dot f? So if we wanted to calculate the magnitude of f in terms of magnitude of f, the vector, in terms of the deformation gradient and the reference <coughs> configuration vector f. Well, the magnitude of f squared is equal to f dot f, which is equal to f f r dot f f r plus order epsilon squared. And we already showed that this is the same as ufr dot ufr because of, oh, making a mess, because of the rotation getting to be removed from the whole thing and the inner product there. So that is equal to u fr dot u fr plus All right, well, that is equal to the square of the magnitude of UFR plus order of epsilon squared like that. So then we know that the magnitude of F is equal to the magnitude of u times its reference configuration counterpart plus <coughs> things that vanish faster than f in the reference configuration. All right, so that's how the length of vectors changes of, you know, small tangent vectors changes. Um, otherwise, they won't really, you know, if you thought about taking a line between two points and deforming the whole thing, well, if it's long, then it's not going to really remain a line in the general case because the deformation gradient doesn't necessarily remain constant. But if you zoom in far enough, it always works. So that's how it varies length. Now, what about the angle between f and g? I don't know how to make that not happen. Um, notifications, man. <clears throat> All right. All right, well, we know that the cosine of the angle between f and g is going to go like their inner product over the product of their magnitudes. So f dot g over magnitude f, magnitude g. <clears throat> and um, so then f dot g is equal to u f r plus u g r plus things that go to zero faster than the square of, no, that's not plus, that is dot. things that go to zero faster than the square of either of their magnitudes. <clears throat> All right, so we also have that the magnitude of f is u 
u is the same as the magnitude of u f r and the magnitude of g is the magnitude of u g r so cosine theta is equal to u f r dot u g r over the magnitude of u f r magnitude of u g r we're going to make that one more definitively a u and that is plus things that go to zero faster than epsilon squared because the denominator <coughs> you have this term and this term multiplying in it so even if you add on to them things that go to zero fast uh, these remain the dominant terms there whereas in the numerator you know the extra terms <coughs> get divided by something that stays that big so that's why it's that way all right, well, if the cosine of the angle goes that way, um, we can see that the cosine of the angle between FR and GR goes the same way, except without any of the U's. So um, the angle between F and G is equal to the angle between U FR and U GR plus things that go away faster than epsilon squared. <coughs> so U contains all the information about shear strain in this case. Um, the rotation has nothing to do with shear strain, which I'm sure you already knew. All right, so let's consider some fixed non-zero vector A, which is going to live in the, it's going to be a material vector. All right, and let's define a scalar lambda like this. And it's definitely a strictly positive one because the deformation gradient <coughs> has to have a determinant that is positive. So lambda is equal to the ratio of F A's magnitude. So after you smush it by the deformation gradient, divided by the magnitude of A in the reference configuration. So that F A magnitude is equal to lambda magnitude A. And we can say that because lambda we've already said is greater than zero. So we don't need absolute value of lambda. So lambda is the factor by which the length of A gets stretched by F, the deformation gradient. Well, clearly, any scalar multiple of A must be stretched by the same factor under F. 
since it's a tensor. Um, so in other words, if S is a scalar, we have F acting on S A is equal to absolute value of S times the magnitude of F A is equal to absolute value of S lambda magnitude of A which is equal to lambda magnitude of SA. <clears throat> so the stretch factor lambda is associated with a direction. All vectors in that direction, plus or minus that direction, are stretched by the same factor. This is sort of the same idea as an eigenvalue being associated with a principal direction, except that these don't have to, you know, f of a is not necessarily a scalar multiple of a, um, but it's stretched by lambda. So for the direction defined by a given unit vector, which we'll call E, then we'll call it lambda sub E, the um, stretch along that, the stretch factor associated with the direction defined by E is for any vector along E, that would be F E magnitude divided by the magnitude of E, but the magnitude of E is one, so that's just the magnitude of F E. <coughs> which is, we showed already, equal to the magnitude of u, e. Well, the square of that is going to be ue dot ue. Whoopsies, don't need that one. And so we can use the definition of the transpose that is equal to E dot U transpose U E, but U is symmetric, so it's E dot U squared E, which is E dot C, E, where C is the right Cauchy green tensor. <coughs> All right, well, if we have an orthonormal basis, E, I, then it's going to go like this in terms of the inner product. Then we have that F acting on EI. So EI is an orthonormal basis for the reference configuration, and we're going to deform them by F. So this is like, hey, what if we take a cube? What happens to its sides if we deform them? Well, 
Well, that is equal to EI. That's a terrible I. Dot F transpose F EJ is equal to EI dot C EJ. So the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor characterizes the inner products of stretch vectors at x. If you think of a stretch vector as u acting on a given material direction, a unit vector in that way. All right, now on to principal stretches and directions, which is the last bit of this uh, <coughs> chapter here. The right and left stretch tensors, U and V, are symmetric. And therefore, they have spectral decompositions, which I idiotically wrote as polar decompositions in my notes. So let's fix that here. All right. So say that u is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of the eigenvalues lambda i times the right eigenvectors ri tensor ri, where those are, of course, an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. And the left stretch tensor is the same thing, but we'll use the left eigenvectors. It's got the same eigenvalues. We'll call them L i tensor product L i with lambda i greater than zero for all i. <clears throat> so the r's are the right principal directions. Those are the principal directions in the reference configuration, and the L's are the principal directions in the spatial configuration. All right, so we know that um, V and U are related by the rotation in the following way. V is equal to R, U, R transpose. So the sum I going from 1 to 3 
lambda i l i tensor l i is equal to r times the sum bleh, i going from 1 to 3 lambda i <coughs> r i tensor r i r transpose well you should remember from homework assignment 2 that is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of lambda i r r i tensor product r r i So we have that um, L i is equal to R R i for each i. So in other words, the left principal directions are just the right principal directions rotated under R. All right, so from all of this, it's going to follow that we can express the Cauchy Green deformation tensors and the Green St. Venant strain like this. So the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor is the sum i going from 1 to 3 of the square of the eigenvalue times ri tensor ri. b is going to look the same way, except it's going to have the l's because it is the left Cauchy green tensor. So it's the square of v. The green St. Venant strain tensor looks like this. It's 1 half C minus the identity. So that is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3 lambda I squared minus 1 RI tensor RI. <clears throat> so, the right principal directions are the principal strain directions in the reference configuration, and the associated principal strains are lambda i squared minus 1 for each i uh, when we're talking about the green St. Venant strain. And the corresponding principal strains are 1 half lambda i squared minus 1 for each i. So i isn't summed or anything. All right, finally, um, because the deformation gradient has the polar decomposition Reu, No, the F in finally is not going to be a tensor. Well, that is equal to R times the sum I going from 1 to 3, lambda I 
ri, tensor product ri. <coughs> well, that is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of lambda i r ri tensor product ri, which is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of lambda i times the left eigenvector i tensor product, the right eigenvector. So, you know, going to, to this here puts the rotation in there, basically. All right, that's all I have for this lesson. Um, there have been a couple questions about the homework. I'm going to put together an example or two, uh, getting pretty close to the deadline for the homework that's due tomorrow. But hey, remember that the divergence of, say, the, uh, the position is equal to Well, that's 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 3. Also, the gradient of the radius in that one problem is <clears throat> right. So I would recommend going about it that way. And then that is equal to one half r dot r to the negative one half grad r dot r. <coughs> And then you can go from there on the rest of it. Um, so that, I think, is the most effective way of doing it. Um, or, you know, if you had r to the p, then you have um, some more to do in there. But I think you can work that out. You basically just use the, uh, the chain rule a bunch of times. But yeah, I so saw a few people get thrown off by the three versus the one. And just this will give you the starting point there. All right, have a good one.